Hello everyone, I'm Mandy Lockley and welcome to On Purpose Astrology. I'm going to be talking about the astrology for the first half of May, including the moon in Taurus. As it's the 1st of May, May Day blessings and Beltane blessings to you if you will celebrate those or if you observe May Day and Beltane. It's a time of fertility in nature, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere as we go from spring into summer. It's also a blending of masculine and feminine energies around Beltane and May Day. That's because fertility depends on that blending in male and female energies. It's observed and celebrated and rituals are performed to help usher in abundance and fertility. So we can think on the personal level at this time, what is blossoming in your life? How are you seeing the fruition of goals you set earlier in the year and what goals can you set to come into fruition later in the year? So it's a time for goal setting, planning and goal setting and setting intentions. That's good energy, of course. That's a that's a good advice for a new moon, any new moon, particularly new moon in Taurus. Before we start talking about that, what about April? Was it intense for you? It was certainly intense for me. We had the solar eclipse and we had the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. I've done two separate videos about the eclipse and the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. You can always go back and look at them if you haven't seen them or you can watch them again and revise. But basically, this eclipse was a total solar eclipse, as I'm sure you probably know. It was on the 8th of April. It was visible across a lot of parts of America. Very intense. A new moon is a darker than moon, but the, the sun literally went dark. The sky literally went dark if you were there to visibly see the eclipse. It was a purging energy. One of the spiritual teachers I've just started working with was talking about this eclipse and she said that it, to some people it knocked them off their feet. And I put my hand up, I said, well, it literally knocked me off my feet. I caught some kind of tummy bug and I got so poorly for a very short amount of time. This is on the evening of the eclipse. I got very poorly and I literally passed out, banged my head. <laughs> the eclipse is in Aries, which is all about the head. I can laugh about it now, but it was pretty scary at the time. But it was very much felt like in retrospect, if it, or even at the time, actually, I had sort of enough sort of consciousness about it to think this is a massive purge you know it's a fresh new start this eclipse is the new beginning for many of us and I felt like lots of toxins have been released both physically and emotionally maybe that might be similar to your experience not literally getting knocked out <laughs> but um but that kind of feeling of things being kind of knocked out of you a little bit, sort of purging things so you can move forward, have clear our energy to bring in a lot of the new energies that are coming in. And Jupiter-Uranus conjunction in April as well. Oh, just to go back onto the eclipse, of course, it's a process. All things in astrology are processes. It's not just something happens on the day and it's one and done. All things are processes. And a total solar eclipse like this is going to have a longer shelf life than a normal new moon, which is, you know, it'll set the tone for the month ahead, perhaps. Um, but it certainly will be short, a short-lived thing that happens on one day. And while an eclipse happens on one day and it's quite short in duration, it has a longer shelf life. So it will be whatever themes and processes are happening for you that happened for you before and then, you know, since the eclipse, those processes will continue to well, to process and to evolve. And so, you know, it's a long shelf life. jupiter Uranus conjunction is the start of a new 14-year cycle. So again, it sets the theme for that whole cycle. Paradigm shifts, quantum leaps, forward leaps, change, excitement, new ideas, sudden change, shocking change even. So really, I think the first the first half of May, certainly the first or eight, nine, ten days of May are all about kind of integrating and consolidating, integrating the energies that we might have 
absorbed during these intensities in April and then consolidating them under this, you know, under or after this new moon in Taurus. So before we get to the new moon, which is the 7th and the 8th of April, depending on your time zone, the 7th if you're in America, as we already said, on the 1st of May, Mars goes into Aries. Also on the 1st of May, I'll talk about Mars in Aries shortly because it is relevant for the new moon, but also on the 1st of May, Venus is conjunct Pluto in Aquarius. Now, this is a very, it's not conjunct, I'm very sorry, it's actually square. <laughs> Venus is square, Pluto in Aquarius, which is intense, but it's one of these short-lived, very short-lived aspects. So today, the 1st of May, and maybe the day after or a couple of days after, you might be thinking about power. How much power do you hold? How much power do you have in relationships? How much power do you have um, in terms of your assets, your resources, your finances? Because Pluto is about power, but Pluto is in Aquarius. How do we share our power? Are we in our own power? Are we letting others have power over us in relationships? Are, are, are our relationships based on an equal footing? The ultimate aim of, one of the ultimate aims of Pluto is empowerment, self-empowerment, and also being able to empower others. Do you empower each other? Perhaps you might be looking at some of the values that you hold in relationships. How much do you control or how much do you let yourself be controlled. These are some thoughts for that, for this Venus square Pluto. As I said, it's a short-lived thing, but you you know, you might have some issues that come up that might need to deal with that might make you think about, well, how do I go forward in a more empowering way? How do I hold myself in my own power without having power and control of other, other people? Also, there might be some financial things about, you know, how much the power of how much we have to spend, our spending power, for example. And then on the 2nd of May, tomorrow, as I record this, Pluto goes into station retrograde. That means it's standing still from our perspective here on Earth. And it will eventually regress back into Capricorn for a very short time before finally later in the year, in the autumn, in the, in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, it will go into Aquarius and it'll stay there until it's finished in Aquarius and which is about 20, 21 years. So when you get something, when you get a planet that, particularly an outer planet that goes into a station, whether it's retrograde or direct, it's just retrograde, like to go backwards. Those energies, the themes and the energies become very intense for that period. So if you have Pluto doing anything in your chart, i.e. if you have anything in the early degrees of the fixed signs in particular, which is, of course, Aquarius, Leo, Taurus, and Scorpio, then you will be feeling, um, when I say early degrees, I mean zero, two, three, or four at the, at the most, really. You will be feeling it very strongly. You will be feeling some extra intensity during this period. And then when it goes back when Pluto goes back into Capricorn, you will perhaps feel that sense of, I have to take responsibility for my own power and how I use it. I've already talked about Pluto and Aquarius being about the power of equality, having equal power with other people. Taking responsibility has been a huge theme for Pluto and Capricorn. What have we learned? We've got one last chance to learn that and then we can take that learning those lessons forward into our lives, taking responsibility. So, you know, this is really the period from now until mid-October. So there's plenty of time again to integrate and consolidate those lessons. So going back to Mars going into Aries today on the 1st of May. So the essence of Mars in Aries, it wants to act, it wants to take action, it wants to do. It's about going forward with courage, bravery, 
confidence. Now, it's very strong for the new moon in Taurus. So we'll talk about it in context to the new moon in Taurus. This energy of wanting to act, it's restless. You know, it wants to do something. It's in Mars in Aries is in a semi-square aspect, which is a 45 degree aspect, it's like half a square. It's in a semi-square aspect, Mars in Aries to the new moon in Taurus. You see the new moon in Taurus there in the square box in the chart. You'll also see that this new moon is conjunct Jupiter and Uranus, which are still officially in a conjunction. They're not in exact conjunction. The energy is obviously still strong and still there. So a new moon is always about taking that time to rest and relax. It's about planning. It's about setting intentions. It's not about taking action. So there might be some friction there. Friction and irritation is kind of what semi squares are all about. What's the friction? What's the irritation? You know, you want to do something, you want to do something, but you, you, you it's not quite ready to act. The moon in Taurus is the moon of, it's, it's traditionally a very good placement for the moon Taurus. It wants to be, it needs to be in its comfort zone. It feels comfortable. It wants to feel comfortable. So that energy of kind of friction and irritation, wanting to do something, but also thinking, oh, I really want to relax. I kind of know that I need to relax, but I need to get this done. That irritation. So what can you do with that energy? One thing that you can do with energy, because one of the um, things about Taurus, all of the signs, they have things that are, you know, more negative and more positive. But one of the things that is more challenging often for Taurus energy, for people that are strong in Taurus, is holding grudges. Because Taurus likes to possess, it likes to hold on to things, it finds it hard to let go. It's a fixed sign. Mars in Aries and Aries generally... They haven't got time. They haven't got time and patience for that. They're happy to just move on. We're talking about pure Aries here. Obviously, it depends on your chart. You might not have much Aries in your chart, but certainly these are the energies that are in the air with Mars in Aries here, with this new moon. Sounds good. So the new moon. So it might be a time to not for action until after the new moon. Because Mars will be in Aries after the after the new moon anyway. So we've got you've got plenty of time, you know, to take action, to do the things that you need to do. But instead, perhaps think about any grudges that you're holding on to, any resentments that you're holding on to, things that other people might have done that upset you. It's an earth sign, Taurus, but it can be quite an emotional sign as well. Also, things you might have mistakes you might have made that you're holding on to and you, you you can't let go that mars in aries energies can be quite helpful to kind of letting that go kind of cleanse the palate so to speak Just setting the attention to do that to think well do i want resentments and grudges in the future no i don't if that's the answer no i don't i want to give it up then maybe this new moon is a good time to set the intention. You can set the intention by writing the intention down, by setting the intention in your meditations, or whatever it is that you use, or whatever method you use, or just with a thought. I don't want this anymore. Help me to let it go. So as I said, new moon in Taurus wants to be super comfortable. Rest and relax if you can. Make plans, set intentions. You're probably, like many of us, quite tired right now, not just from the intensity of April, but also from, you know, everything that's happened so far this year or even previous years. So take that time to rest and relax. Take that time to maybe breathe into that irritability and discomfort you might be feeling about, well, I should be doing something, I should be doing something. You might not even know what it is you should be doing, but there's that sense of feeling, I should be doing something, but I know I need to rest. Be kind to yourself, let yourself rest, because the time will come when you will be able to take action. Now, as we move up into the full moon on the 23rd of May, Mars will still be in Aries then, and Mars will still be an aspect, actually, to that 
full moon but i'll talk about that in the next video so again that'll be the time to sort of really take action really or actually even about a week before to be honest even about a week before so the the full the the full moon is it is the better time but about to take action and start working on those attentions you were set whether you set them at the Beltane, whether you set them at the new moon or both. So as I said, once we move out of that new moon period, then we can start new projects, put new ideas into action, take on challenges. Mars in Aries loves a challenge. You know, to step into those paradigm shifts, think about those forward leaps, now uh, we're talking about Jupiter and Uranus, of course. You know, that promise of change. Again, that's quite difficult for Taurus. That's why often with the fixed signs, change comes in a shocking and unexpected way because there's been so much energy put into holding on and maintaining. Taurus does a brilliant job of maintaining and building on things and structures and emotions that are already set in place sometimes it forgets to I mean we need that of course we do sometimes it forgets to let go you know it let goes a little bit too late and then the universe can intervene and take things away from you and then it's a shock so that's another thing to think about and this is where we might be experiencing that Jupiter Uranus conjunction but we can also experience that Jupiter Uranus conjunction of great excitement of course so forward movement, forward movement. So then what happens after the new moon? Well, the sun moves on, doesn't it? The sun moves on very quickly. It moves a degree a day. So it will very quickly on the 13th of May, it will be conjunct Uranus. And on the 14th of May, it will, sorry, the 15th of May, it will be conjunct Jupiter. So, again, this is a time when we can take some action, start acting on some of the intentions and plans that we set during the new moon. It can be unsettling, potentially. You know, when changes come in, feelings of uncertainty, Taurus like security, safety, certainty. That's beloved of Taurus. And perhaps we can find ourselves in a fixed mindset. However, it's very much a time of thinking about change and where we might need to make changes after this new moon. Because on the 20th of May, the energy shifts again. And I'll talk about this more in the next video. The energy shifts again into Gemini. So it's gone from that flex from that fixed energy that wants to build and maintain and hold things in place to energy that shifts and is flexible and is adjustable. So again, the second half of May has a very different feeling from the first half of May. The first half of May is very much about taking a deep breath. Now, the thing about new moons and full moons and any kind of lunation is that they always involve the sun of course we call it a, a, a new moon we call it a full moon but it's about its relationship to the sun the sun is all about whether it's in taurus whether it's in gemini whatever sign it's in the sun is always about how we step into our purpose it, it holds some of the keys a lot of the keys to what our purpose is our life purpose is it's what's at the heart of us the sun rules the heart. So during any intensity or any difficulty or irritation, a good practice, and a lot of spiritual teachers that I've been following recently are talking about this, is to move into your heart space, the sun. So it's not just about purpose and finding purpose of the sun, it's also about compassion and forgiveness and it's about being full of heart, generous generosity, for example, 
courage as well can also come from the heart. We talked about courage for Mars in Aries, but courage can also come, and, and Mars generally, but courage can also come from the heart. So if you're feeling a little bit scared, if you're feeling a little bit unsettled, which might be the case in this first half of May, then just stepping into your heart space might be helpful to you. How do you do that? Well, there's lots of ways to do it, but on the most basic level, we would just simply breathe into our heart space. Ground yourself first. Taurus is, of course, an earth sign. Ground yourself first. How do you ground yourself? Well, in nature. Can't be in nature all the time, but we're always usually in a position where we can put our feet on the ground or on the floor or wherever we are. Feel the soles of your feet against the surface. Feel your bum on the chair, for example. And you're making connection, then you're grounding into your body. You're settling into your body. And then you can also, if you want to, imagine or visualize tree roots going right down from the soles of your feet down into the center of the earth. That's a good way to feel very grounded. And from there, to center yourself into your heart, simply breathe. Simply as you breathe, as you breathe in, take a big, deep breath in. You imagine that breath filling up your heart space. And as you breathe out, you imagine that you're breathing out any of these kind of stresses. You know, it can really calm you down. Breathing is fantastic to calm you down. So that's just sort of simple methods, you know, for finding equilibrium during what can be quite a um, unsettling time of change. But do remember, please, that the energies this May are slightly more relaxed than they were in April which again is why I called this video integration and consolidation. Now, another thing I wanna briefly talk about before I finish is Sedna. See Sedna there in that square. Sedna is one of the dwarf planets. She moved into Gemini on the 27th of April. So just, um, just, just a few days ago. She was in Gemini from June 2023 to November 2023. Then she retrograded back into Taurus, but now she's settled into Gemini until 2067. She's one of the dwarf planets. She's a trans-Neptunian object, which means she's far, far, far out in, in outer space, far onto the some of the outer reaches of our solar system. But she has an orbit of 11,400 years, says a lot about how far away she is from us. She was discovered in 2003 and she came in like all of these trans-Neptunian objects and there are many of them. And by the way, I can only touch briefly on some of the themes of Sedna here. If you want to learn more about Sedna, I'll put a link to a video I did. It's about 20 minutes long, a lot of the themes and the mythology of Sedna. But I believe, it's my belief, she's, she's an Inuit goddess of the ocean and it's my belief that she's coming to reinitiate our ourselves reinitiate our consciousness into the divine feminine it's a story her myth is a story of transformation into the divine of abandonment but also freedom abandoning patriarchal hold and becoming a goddess in the process the story is in essence, she was abandoned by her husband. So there's that theme of abandonment by the, by the male figures. Her father went to collect her from her husband's home. And when he was taking her home, there was a storm at sea. They were in a boat and only one of them could be saved. So her father abandoned her also. He threw her over the side of the boat. She grasped onto the side of the boat to pull herself up. Instead, her father saved himself and cut her fingers off so that she couldn't grasp. So she fell to the bottom of the deep ocean. And there she was transformed into the goddess of the ocean, the protector of the ocean. So you can see that human woman being abandoned, but by being abandoned and having only herself to care for her, she didn't belong to anyone anymore. She was independent. In a way, she was freed. She became a goddess. And those fingers that her father cut off, 
they became the marine mammals such as whales, dolphins, turtles. But as I said, I feel that there's a sense of a spiritual awakening available with Sedna because it's the power of the divine feminine that is now accessible to all of us. We can all access the divine feminine if we wish to, if we choose to, if we wish to initiate ourselves into the divine feminine, we can feel that direct connection with the divine. We don't have to go through a patriarchal system of, you know, being connected by someone else, you know, we can do it directly. She was discovered in 2003 and between then and kind of now she's at the closest she will ever be or is ever in her orbit, which is obviously why she was discovered at that point. But that means that connection that she has with us is the closest we will have in our lifetime. So she's in Gemini now and she joins Pluto in the air signs. Aquarius is, of course, an air sign and Gemini is the first air sign. So we're, asked, we're invited to ask questions, to be curious about Sedna. Now she's in Gemini. How can we honour the divine feminine power? You know, how can we step into reinitiating ourselves into the divine feminine? What resources do we have? How do we need to change and adapt ourselves, our energy? Gemini, of course, is about learning and education. Perhaps we will feel like we need to take some courses or learn some more information. Perhaps we've had a diverse learning already. Perhaps we've learned a little bit of this here, a little bit of this there. Maybe we've taken courses, maybe even gotten some certificates here and there. And we may feel at this time now that these things start to integrate in quite magical ways, that everything we've learned comes into some kind of fruition. And we can use that to step into our energy and our power. But it's also about perhaps learning to separate facts from you know, gossip or opinion or rumour, for example. And this is where we can use or we can learn to better use our own intuition. What's right? What's wrong? What's right for us? The Divine Feminine, Gemini with the Divine Feminine is very much about that theme, that intuition that is kind of sensed as a kind of a feminine quality. Now, when I talk about feminine, I'm not talking about biological male, female. We all have the divine feminine in us and the divine masculine. We all have that whatever our gender, whether it's gender by birth or gender by choice. So learning to trust our intuition. We might also think about where are we losing our grip? Our grip on reality, our grip on knowledge, our grip on information. And like Sedna in the myth, what is the cost of letting go? When she let go, she was forced to let go. She lost her life, of course. But what's the cost of holding on? So what do we need to let go of? Perhaps we need to let go of old beliefs, ideas and opinions to step into the new. Just a few thoughts there. So I hope... This is helpful. I hope you have a fantastic May. I, as always, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Much appreciated. And I love you all. Thanks. Bye-bye.